My name is uh, Dr. Montai Dada. I'm a, I'm a professor of political science here at U of R. It's great to see you all tonight. Um, I'm really excited. I think you're going to enjoy uh, tonight's guest lecture. We're hosting uh, my friend and colleague, Kevin Bales. And I'll just briefly introduce you to, to him and we'll get started. And after his talk, uh, Dr. Bales is very happy to have some Q&A, get some discussion going. And we're always looking for, for new research assistants. <laughs> Really. Um, so Kevin Bales is Professor of Contemporary Slavery and Research Director at the Rights Lab, University of Nottingham. He co-founded the NGO Free the Slaves in the United States, and his 1999 book, Disposable People, New Slavery in the Global Economy, has been published in 12 languages. Um, it's one of the foundational texts of the modern anti-slavery movement. Uh, Desmond Tutu called the book a well-researched, scholarly, and deeply disper disturbing expose of modern slavery. Uh, there was a film based on disposable people that uh, Dr. Bills co-wrote, and that won a Peabody Award and two Emmys. And the Association of British Universities has named his work one of the 100 world-changing discoveries. In 2007, he published one of my favorite books, Ending Slavery, How We Free Today's Slaves. In 2009, he co-published The Slave Next Door, Modern Slavery in the United States. In 2016, his research institute was awarded the Queen's Anniversary Prize, and his most recent book was Blood and Earth, Modern Slavery, Ecocide, and the Secret to Saving the World. So, my friends, please uh, give a warm round of applause for my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Kevin Bale. I mean, thank you, Montai. Um, I'm, I'm going to pull my mask down because I just don't breathe on the front row. Okay. It, it, it's, it's, it is so formal sometimes in American academic worlds because everybody's calling each other doctor and professor. And you know, over in the UK, we just don't do that. It just doesn't happen. You know, we, everyone uses their first names, and that's that. Right? So anyway, so if you feel like calling me Kevin, or you want to put your hands up and say, Kevin, why the hell did you say that? Feel free to just do it, do it that way. Can you hear me OK with this? Back there in the back corner? Got it? OK. Good. OK. Um, I'm going to take you on a broad tour of what's happening, not exactly just in the world of contemporary forms of slavery, but also in the scientific and social scientific worlds that are now expanding in their study of contemporary forms of slavery. And part of that is down to the, the Rights Lab. Now, the Rights Lab we established about five years ago. The University of Nottingham decided that it was number one in the world with two or three things like MRI. But it wanted to be number one in more things. So it put out this call and said, bring us an idea for some kind of special lab or what they called a beacon of excellence. And they were expecting it to be electric airplanes or you know, uh, tiny insects that were actually robots that could like, keep your crops happy or something like that. They thought it was going to be hard science stuff. But we brought them the idea of saying, what if we put together a research institute that just focused on contemporary forms of slavery, but from all the possible directions that you could bring to this, not just like writing about it or doing ethnographic research, but literally coming at it with a lot of scientific approaches. So that's, that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about unlocking the science of slavery, about how we're bringing more and more what might be seen as hard scientific, but are in fact also linked together with human rights, ways of, of, of addressing contemporary slavery. Now, I think it's important to say <coughs> science and technology have always served slavery. And, I, and you can see I did this funny little mix-up picture here where I took the old slave ship uh, that uh, Thomas Clarkson originated in the year 1788, and I stuck it on top of an airplane, right? Because while there were boat technologies in, in the 1780s that were used to take people across the Atlantic in, in slave ships. All kinds of technologies are still being used to put people and take people into slavery. But I'm also going to jump back, and a couple of people have seen this today already, but I won't be here long, and say, 
If we look back in human history, and in fact, if we go back to the original writing that first occurred with human beings, Sumerian cuneiform, what we find at 5,000 years ago is in that very first writing made by human beings, there are records that say, so we got our bronze swords together, we climbed up into the mountains, and we captured a bunch of people to make them slaves. So from the very beginning of the first written records of human beings, there was slavery that they could keep track of. And, and why, it, you know, it, it, it seems strange to think of these kind of glyph marks as information technology, but that was the first information technology. The first time people were able to keep counting, writing out words, and so forth, and making glyphs. This was the original information technology, and one of the key uses of it was keeping track of how many slaves you had, how many you were trying to get, what you were going to do with them, and so forth. By the time you get into the Iron Age, we think of that as you know beginning to make things iron only, but if you actually go back into the archaeology of the Iron Age, one of the things that you find a lot of isn't just weapons or pots, it's slave control technologies, chains, manacles, collars, all kinds of things that were used to enslave people as they went, broke through the first technologies of iron. This looks like a Viking ship. It is a Viking ship. But Viking ships were actually designed to be slave capture and delivery systems. We, if you, it's, it, I love that uh, recent TV series that was about Vikings from the History Channel, and it was really fun to watch. But they kind of uh, downplayed the enormously extensive network of slave trading, slave capture, slave delivery that happened, that kept the entire Viking culture and civilization a, a wash with silver and gold because of its, of its they, they, if you can imagine them in Norway, they went through Russia all the way down the rivers, all the way down to Turkey, all the way down to Arabia, picked up people, spying and selling them all the way down that way. Likewise, all the way across the Atlantic, captured, raiding Dublin and Ireland to capture women, to take to Iceland, to sell to the wives, to the Vikings who were set up there. And these, these quick ships that they had were perfect for rushing into an area, jumping out, weaponry, capturing people, put them on the ship, away, before any kind of organized resistance could occur. Now, one of the things that's been exciting is that there, these technologies are not the technologies that we have to worry about or bring to bear on the problem today. You know, the ships, the, 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 the iron shackles and that thing. We still see some of those things. You know, we see people locked up. But the, the, the technologies that we're bringing as anti-slavery anti-slavery scholars. That's a whole, that's a, that's, that's the application in, you know, that we use to reduce the amount of slavery. The World Bank and others um, has, have led, have been supportive, as well as a lot of other groups, about how do we begin to get a handle on this, understand the size and shape of it, and also find those weak points that we can address, right? So, now, we're able to say science and technology serves freedom, as, as well as today, in some ways, also slavery and crime. One of, the, one of the things that's happened just since we built the rights lab five years ago has been an enormous advance in satellite detection of So, this is a, this is actually a satellite image of something called the Shundervans UNESCO World Heritage Site at the bottom of Bangladesh. Right? So as a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it means that it's supposed to be untouched, completely untouched. Right? It's the last area that was untouched in this part of South Asia. There are a whole bunch of endangered species that live there. Uh, no one is supposed to go and cut the trees or anything like that. And so you can see what it should look like, and then you can also see something else, right, that shouldn't be there. Now, we began to see these in satellite images, and I also went there on the water in a boat 
and did some research up and down of these. So I know that looks a little bit like buildings, but they're not buildings. They're fish drying racks where they've cleared it all, and then they've built these racks, and then they've gone up the river, and they've said to little farmers that live on each side of the river, if you have a child that would like to come and work with us for a month or two or three, uh, we'll pay you a little bit right now, and then they'll be able to bring the money. And then they put their, the kids that they get on the boat, and they take them to a place where their parents will never find them. And they usually never return as well. It's very rare that they actually return from these, from these fish processes. And you can see that what they do all day is cut fish, hang it up to dry, and so forth. And you can also see, I want you to notice the tall racks in the distance there, because there's a close-up of those in a moment. It's kind of important. This was a very brave photographer, a Bangladeshi photographer, who actually caught a picture of, a, of, a, of one of the slave drivers working in the fish processing camp, beating these children to make them work faster, because they have to work as fast as they can when the, when the ships land their fish and they push them along. I'll tell you where the fish go in a minute. I was able to see this from the, from the water, from the ground, and sneak around in the woods and look at things. Uh, but then when we, I brought it back to the lab, they, and they understood what, what I was beginning to be concerned about, they discovered that, well, let's use, let's use the satellites to actually see if there are any more of these, how does this work, what goes on. And very quickly, because it's a satellite, they were able to turn up 12 of these camps, at least, and in places where no one had any idea that they existed. The police didn't know, the NGOs didn't know, the environmentalists didn't know, or so forth. They began, we began to find these satellite, through, through the satellite imagery. Right? Let me go stay there for a second. The one thing that, I, that I'd say to you about it as well, that was just horrific, and where this has this intersection with global, not just global warming, it's climate change, but also with species loss and environmental destruction is, on one hand, you can see that all the trees have been cut. And those are mangrove trees. And the reason, the other key reason why the Sugar Boots UNESCO World Heritage Site is so important is because that enormous mangrove swamp almost is the largest carbon sink in Asia. So it's not an enormous space, but mangroves are like 12 times better at sucking carbon out of the air than say an oak tree. They're smaller, but they're really powerful because they push CO2 out into the water through their roots. So, got a nod there for a botanist, right? Yeah, all right, right old body. Um, and yet, here they are being cut, right? These mangroves, which are so crucial. But the other part about the big issue I should tell you is that when I met up with some children who had escaped, the next morning after their escape, up river, and I talked to them about their life in the fish processing camps. And I'm saying, well, you know, how was it? And they were saying, we were beaten, we didn't barely got enough sleep, we had, we had to eat fish guts. And I said, well, did you have any health problems? Well, you know, were you ever ill? And they said, they all, they all agreed, yeah, the, most problem, the main problem they almost all had was diarrhea. They didn't know what else it was to be called. They were saying that they didn't have diarrhea. And they said sometimes people would die, but they died. Um, and I said, okay, so after that, what, what was your next most health, serious health problem? And this was the one that left me just dumbfounded. Every child that I interviewed out of eight had either seen or knew a child who had been eaten by a tiger. Now, I know this is, that's kind of mind-blowing, but one of the reasons the Schindermann's World Heritage Site is a World Heritage Site is that it's the last major breeding ground of the Bengal tigers. It's where they go to be like free and have a normal life. But if you take, if you cut down their forest and you insert and, and you drive away the little deer that they eat and then you insert a new prey animal, which means little boys and girls, that's what they'll eat. But it was a shocker to me. It was sort of a shocker to a lot of us. We'll go on to more what that we can see from space, right? One of the things that, has anyone ever taken part in, in what's called citizen science? Sort of crowdsourced, yeah, I got one hand back there. Um, 
crowdsourcing information or you calling on people to, to all get together on, on websites and you know, work through uh, sort of data grooming and thinking and understanding and working together with that. One of the things that we were very concerned about is that one of the major contributors to CO2 on planet Earth is in fact brick kittens in South Asia, which are very primitive, right? They're very primitive. They use slave labor. They, the slaves make the bricks by hand. They load these kilns by hand. They fire them by hand. They burn old tires, coal, motor oil, stuff that would never be allowed to be burned in this country because it's like instantaneous, noxious, poisonous chemicals into the air, right? But they, they, they belch out all these horrific things, including the CO2, as well as these bad particulates and like that. But one of the things that was stymieing and confusing our understanding of the breadth and the size and exactly the nature of slavery and brick kilns. I understood it up close because I'd gone to brick kilns and I'd hung around people and worked on and climbed over them and stuff like that. But nobody knew how many there were and nobody knew where they all were. So we built a, uh, an online system where citizen scientists, and they were mostly university students, could go on and learn how to identify a brick kiln of the sort that I'm talking about, the kinds that were, were 95% of those used in slave workers, often whole families. And they would learn how to like make a dot right in that particular place because they could recognize that that was one of those oval kilns that were the sort that, that, were, that, that we were trying to figure out. So we had all of these citizen scientists, all these university students, looking for the brick kilns and satellite photos, marking them with GPS locators and all that kind of stuff. What they didn't know was that, and here, here's exactly some of the stuff that they would be working with, that the reason you, you'd always see this, that's the shadow of the chimney. And the oval is how it burns around and around during the brick firing period. But behind the front end of this program, was, there, you know, there's no such thing as AI yet. It'll be around in about 2040, 2045. But there was, there is machine learning. And so we had built the algorithms behind it that would learn from all of these students who were finding it. Until finally, it took like six or eight weeks of student work, the machine learning program said, okay, I think I've got this. I'm, I'm, I'm now identifying them faster than the, than the humans do, right? And better with more accuracy. So we turned the, the uh, machine learning loose after the volunteers, the, you know, in, in the press they always talk about artificial intelligence, but you know, we, 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 the volunteers taught a machine learning algorithm to it. And we now know there are 58,346 brick kilns in India, Pakistan, Nepal, and parts of Bangladesh. We know, you know, exactly where they are, right down to their precise uh, GPS coordinates. And today, what we're able to do is, in fact, there are NGOs and some law enforcement in these countries. And can you, you can tell where we are, right? That's that's Bangladesh down there, and uh, that's. The, the bumpy border right up there is, is the difference between India and Nepal, and then up there you're in the Pakistan. And we're able to say to the law enforcement in this place, or the NGO in that place, you want to know about slavery and brick kilns? Here's the GPS videos. And you can put it on your smartphone, phone, and you can find the place, you can do the investigation, and you can do the raid, and you can get a pretty good story. Now, have they hit all 15,000? No, not yet. Right? But at least we're moving in that direction. That's just a heat, sort of a heat map across the what's called the brick belt, right? Uh, because that bit is geologically good soil that you can make bricks from. All of that huge area. Right? Now, one of the things that we can need to focus on to understand the current situation as well is this one thing 
that has changed dramatically about contemporary about slavery in the world. Right? And if you'd been here 11 years ago, I probably would have talked about the same point because this was something that we figured out early on. But the the the, the absolute foundational part of this is that while the, the action of enslaving people is basically the same, it's like this total control that you exercise over someone, you treat them as if they're property, you use them like property, and, and remember, you, what can you do with your property? You can also destroy your own property, so you know people do destroy their own property when they're slaves as well. But the key difference is between the population explosion, which took us from, well, you know what, the year I was born, there were two and a half billion people on the planet. And we're just about to hit eight. And what happens when you flood a market with a commodity? Yeah, they get really cheap. The price collapses. And in fact, this chap right here, this young boy in Nepal, is this sort of classic example of this. So they're they're offered, their parents are offered some money. They say, to this kid come and help us move some stone around up and down the, the paths in Nepal. And they go to work hauling these paving stones. Obviously, it's a really rough job. Right? Um, but here's the thing. Not surprisingly, given that they don't have roads in much of Nepal, and they're literally walking up and down rocky paths, they fall down sometimes. And they fall into ravines and like that. What happens when a child slave falls into a ravine with the paving stone in Nepal? The slave holder, if they're anywhere around, comes to the child, takes the paving stone, and leaves the child. Why? Because they're not worth picking up, they're not worth repairing, they're not worth taking to the doctor. It's cheaper if they've hurt in any way. It's actually less expensive to go and get a new kid in the next village by fooling people. Why? Because of this. If you look across, and this is where I had, I had enormous amounts of help from, from historians of the deep past when I was first working on this. And we, we, it took a long time to, to find and create the equations of the cost of slaves in the past. And as you can see, that the cost in the past went up and down and up and down over time, but it never really went below the equivalent of $40,000 in today's money or $45,000 in, in today's money. Average. So across most of human history, slaves were expensive. I mean, I can illustrate that with, with the American example, right? The average slave, and by that I mean like an 18-year-old strong young fellow in the year 1855 or 1860 in Virginia, went for $1,200. What could you buy in Virginia for $1,200? A house, eight oxen, anywhere between 50 and 200 acres of land for $1,200, right? Slaves of the past were expensive, but the current situation where we have a dramatically increased volume of people, a very large number of the poor and vulnerable means the prices collapse. And it's collapsed, as you can see, particularly as the population zoomed past anything it had ever been before and created this overblood. And we're down to this average price in the world today of the cost of acquiring a person into slavery is something like $90 to $100, average. Now, I, I know people who have been enslaved for $10, $20, whole families for that amount in places like rural India, where, you know, that doesn't count for much. If you wanted to literally go out and try to get your hands on someone you could, you could use as an enslaved person in the United States, it would be more in the low thousands, right? You want two or three or four thousand, something like that. But it's a, you know, it's a, it's a collapse. And that, what's important about that is that it's altered what has been the universal global reality of enslavement, which is that slaves in the past were worth so much more, that they could be cared for more, they could be replaced more, they were worth fighting over, and so forth. Now, we've also 
had some breakthroughs. And that's a breakthrough, and we're still trying to work through how to help, for example, economists, I'm backing a little bit, understand this. Because I have to say, pure economists still say, that can't be right, or what does that got to do with us? Or, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting situation that, that they find it hard to grasp that this can be some kind of a game changer, but we need to have the economists help us with it, these theoretical economists. There's a chair there, you know, and, you can, and there's plenty up here. Right. Um, but we also need to go in measurement with about, we, about how many people are involved. <coughs> when was the last really accurate measurement of slavery anywhere? Do you want to put a, a rough guy? Yes? Where they really knew how many slaves they had. 1860, American South. 1860. The 1860 census one before the Civil War, did a precise count of the slaves in the United States, fundamentally in the, in the deep south. 2.3 or so million people were slaves. But if they knew, you know, in, in the actual census, it's like 2,342,600, whatever it was. You know, that there were a precise number for the number of slaves in the United States. That may be the last ever accurate count of people in slavery in, in, in our, you know, in time. Uh, there were others before that. You go all the way back to ancient Sumeria, and you would have counts there. And in Rome, you would have counts. In Greece, you would have counts of slaves that where they kept good records. But now, it's all hidden away. And it's hidden away because it's treated as, it is a crime, of course, but it's also a crime that doesn't obey the rules of crime measurement. Criminological statistics are based on the concept that a crime is an event. Like, you get mugged, that takes 10 minutes. You get burgled, that takes 12 minutes. If someone steals your bicycle, it's gone in five minutes, right? Assaults, they take, they take 20, 15 minutes. I mean, all of those things are events, and then they are treated as events. But what is the event of the crime of enslavement? It's a crime that begins but no one knows when it's going to be. And you can be in the process of being victimized for a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. It, 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 it's hard to catch because there's no one to report it because the person who's the victim of the crime is caught up in the crime itself for a period of time which you cannot predict. You cannot predict. Once it, they, it, it, if they do come to freedom, and this is just to say one more thing about criminological statistics, is we know that there are, there are crime statistics which are less, crimes that are less likely to be reported than others, right? Almost every murder is reported. But sexual assault, no, right? We know that there's a very low reporting of sexual assault because there's a stigma attached to it. Well, what's interesting, just so you know, People who have been enslaved, they feel that stigma. People who come out of slavery after a year or two or five or whatever, they'll say, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to report this. I don't want, you know, they, they want to move out, move on somehow. But where, where we are, in a sense, is roughly this. We have some good estimations for a lot of countries. We have some okay good estimations for a lot of countries. Monti, has also worked on these with me in the past when we were doing the first global estimates with some very kind funding from an Australian billionaire who helped us to get this put together. But you can see the densities. Two things to point out here. You can see the densities, right? The darker the reds, <coughs> the, 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 the more slavery. And, and you can see like that little dot there is Haiti, which has a very high um, proportion of its population. Though when I say high, we're not talking half. One of the things that's happened in the world today is that the proportion of populations which are enslaved are in the fractions, right? Are in the fractions. It's only in the very worst places where it even gets into like whole numbers, or maybe 5% or 2%. But I also want to point out to you that you notice there are no blank spots in this map. I remember years ago I used to say, 
you know, I think, it, you know, there's slavery everywhere except Iceland. And I said that once in the talk, and this woman put her hand up and said, look, I'm a member of the Icelandic parliament. Can we got it to me? I'm like, okay. And then I found out, right, that they had also been through measurements, and it's, it's definitely not So we know it's global, we know it's saturated, and we've got that kind of measurement. But then we've um, begun to measure using an interesting technique. It's actually a technique that was originally designed to, to tell you how many fish lived in a fjord in Norway. And it, and it has to do with a certain kind of sampling technique that, that um, allows you to estimate the universe from three overlapping samples. So you see those little bubbles down there where there's three overlapping bubbles. And there's a way that you can build the algorithm so that they will predict what the actual size of the universe is. That meaning, when I say universe, I don't mean the cosmos. I'm just, I mean, in the statistical sense, what's your big, what's your, what's your, your whole space that you're trying to figure out? Now, why is this important? Because we've been able to measure in poor countries how get some good estimates from asking questions and from surveys about how many people might be in slavery in, in the poorer countries. But in the rich countries like the United States, where we know the, the amount of people in slavery is very low, that it's very, you can't do surveys big enough to catch the number of people who might be in slavery. But you can use this. So the first time we used this was actually for Great Britain. And we were able to find the three necessary bits, and nobody had a clue in Great Britain about how many people were in slavery in Great Britain, but it came out with this very clear and reliable estimation of about of 10 to 13,000 people in slavery in Great Britain. Since then, we've also gone to, the reason I say works in cities like New Orleans is because we've now done it for the city of New Orleans, right? Worked with, the, with NGOs and police and everything there, and, and they said, okay, we'll put all this together. And then we said, in the New Orleans of two years ago, there's about a thousand people in slavery. Right? We can't be absolutely certain about it with precision because this is an estimation, not a count. But at least it gives the city, the NGOs, all of those kinds of operations an idea about how to make that go. Now, the reason why I say America, what are you waiting for? Is because when I, I, I'm in different countries, I always put this out and say, wouldn't you like to know what the size and shape of the problem is in the United States? Because we don't know. We don't know. You would think we would know, but we don't know. There, there have not been the types of statistical operations of estimation, much less any kind of count. And when you try to put the state data together with the federal, it's, it's a mess. Okay. Does anyone here do corpus linguistics? Did they do it at this university? Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a statistical uh, computer-based analysis of speech. Um, I'm going to put, a, this is a little, you, er, you, er, <coughs> everybody's seen a, cloud, a word cloud like this, right? I, uh, I made this one on a little thing on the web, uh, but I reached in and pulled about uh, 3,000 words out of a, slave, a, a contemporary slave narrative, somebody's discussion of what, it, what was happening to them when they were in slavery, and I pulled like 3,000 words out, and then this was what came out, and I, which I found in, in itself, because um, that thought would be this key word, right? About that would be coming out from this, this, this person who had survived slavery and he was talking about it. I mean, some of the other things would kind of make sense, but um, about wanting and moving and never and difference and so forth. And God gets in here up there and so forth. But, so in, a, in one way, something like a, a simple little word bubble like this is, the, is a very simple form of corpus linguistics. But it's much, this is the very simple form, right? You can, we, you, can, you can use it to study the voices of people who've been in slavery and how they think and what they say. And you can do that with millions of words within what we call survivor narratives. We now have collections of, of several thousand survivor narratives of people in the present and the immediate past. And one of the things that it helps us to understand that I have to say was a bit mind-blowing for me when it began to open our eyes 
to something, which is fundamentally that if you've never been enslaved or been under this total control of another person, it's very hard to understand the psychological state that you end up in if you have to. If, you, you know, if you've only ever known freedom, it's very hard to understand the, these, this different state of thinking and being. For example, survivors, in their millions of words, almost never use the future tense or talk in any way about the future. And if they do, they touch on the future, they immediately follow by a sudden past tense. Also, they, they, they say me, not I. In other words, they talk of themselves as an object, not a subject. But more, there's more than that, right? What that backs up is what some of our survivor scholars, because now we have survivors with PhDs who work in such areas as corpus linguistics, say to us, oh, well, this, we understand this perfectly. Because when you're in slavery, they said, and this is something that we try to explain to you guys, but you don't get it, is that when you're actually caught into a situation in slavery, and you're controlled and compressed and, and worried about pain and suffering because of, of the kind of brutality which is, which is put out upon you, right? You, you, you reach a state of what the survivors have said to us is, they say, it's, you be, it's atemporality. In other words, you become disassociated from time. And what they mean by that is that fundamentally the slave driver, master, owner, or whatever you want to call them, they don't want the person they control to think about a future. They don't want them to think about a past. They want them to live in an eternal present, which is only focused on the concerns and needs and desires of the slave owner. And the people who are caught up in slavery learn to contract their consciousness to a point where they live in an eternal present. They don't think about the present, the future, they don't think about the past. They live right there, knowing that if they do move in either direction out of the present, they'll be harmed, which is true. The slave owner gets it, it's like you're not paying attention, bang, 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 and a spatiality. In other words, they, they come to the end of the idea that they have freedom of movement. They can't go this way, they can't go that way. They stay where they're put, because they know if they move, Again, the pain, the suffering, the stop. So they live in this place which is an eternal present stuck in the single place that the slave holder wants them to be. Now, I had been around people in slavery for 20 years before a, a slavery survivor explained this to me. And it sort of opened my eyes to things that I've been seeing for decades. But you know, this is the kind of interior things that people know, but only when they know in their own minds. And then they, when they get to the point, they can share it. And what's fascinating is that when, when we then go back into the narratives that slaves have written all the way back into the 19th century and the 18th century, you begin to pick up the hints of this. You begin to understand it when you look at it through a kind of court, a, a kind of analytic. And but all of that begins to lead to what one of, she was one of my PhD students. She's now a uh, full-time PhD and researcher within the lab, uh, who's a survivor herself, says, you know, this is this is what we call the, you know, if you want to understand it, it's an epistemology of survival. It's how you survive being destroyed as a person in slavery. It's what the lived experience, the lived reality is. Now, when we can understand that, we can actually begin to do a much better job of working with people who are survivors, getting them in the right direction, listening to them, and so forth. Then we begin later, right? We take the satellites, we take the only the data, the time series, we start counting slaves and murderers. So, for example, <coughs> pardon me. Now, this is not <coughs> it's not COVID, I promise. I have a nine-year-old who was coughing on me before I left home. I have a little bit of so, okay. But it's just, yeah. So this is not uh, Brazil. This is actually the Amazon. So this is just a chunk of Brazil, right? <coughs> and then up at the top, you can see the Amazon River. That's the purpley thing up there at the top. Now, the important thing about this map is that 
<coughs> which the colors are not coming through quite here as well as they are here. But the important thing about this map is that all the bits that are green are areas of the Amazonian forest which are absolutely protected and should never be cut. All the bits that are yellow, which are a little more bright here, but not maybe, maybe, maybe you can see it if I can. All the bits that are yellow are areas, like all of this is yellow as opposed to green. Right? All the bits that are yellow are bits of the Amazonian forest that should never have been cut, but have been cut illegally. And what you can actually do is follow the criminality of slave-based deforestation. People think that when the people, the Amazon gets knocked down and we begin to lose the lungs of our planet, that it's done with bulldozers. It's not. It's done with slave labor. And the reason it's done with slave labor is because bulldozers are obvious. Giant trucks are obvious. The criminals want to take some people into the woods, give them saws, knock the stuff down, pull these logs out one at a time, and yet they're just like ants, right? Going along, going along. And you can see how that, how the, there's this there's streaking. Now the purpley bits are actually, these, these bits are actually bits that were never preserved. So that, they don't count anyway. They were, they were those areas that weren't separated as set aside. But you can also see the dots. The blue, the blue dots are murders, Oh, sorry, are slavery cases, and the red dots are murders. And, and the classic is something like this cluster right there. Because if you can see, the yellow bits have basically been a road. It's been driven across this bit, and there's a big yellow circle where criminals went in and they just began to expand out in the middle of what at that point was a remote an untouched part of the Amazon. And the big dot means that there were at least 20 slavery cases in that location. And I think there are 12 red dots, 12 murders in that location with that particular set of criminal people to be forced But we actually know it was much more. And we know because um, there's not a single one of these of these Amazonian slave-based deforestation work that doesn't have the disappearance of a large number of people. We know that um, people get injured, they get tired, they get sick, they get murdered, and they just bury them in the forests. So we and, and I've been out with some of the there's a, there's a, there's a, the, the, the forest police in Brazil are called Ibama. That's their acronym. Uh, but I've been out with Ibama police, and we're just sometimes walking through looking for the graves. We're looking for anything that could help us find how many people have been buried in these places near the deforestation sites and like that. Then we begin to link slavery to other global issues. One of the things that we're able to do it with great precision now are things like, this is Mali, right? Just the country of Mali. And we're able to use both satellite imagery and hard data to run down, and for example, the, on, the, on that side, that's a heat map of conflicts over, a, over a, a one year period. And on this side, a particular set of where all of those conflicts were occurring in Mali. Mali, you won't necessarily know this, but was torn apart by some internal stuff, and then Russian mercenary fighters were sent in by Putin on one side, and then the war got much worse. And it's still pretty much a bad situation. Violence against civilians, no militia interventions, and so forth. And, and, and then we can also, for a place like Mali, begin to chart individual levels of migration and displacement, what's pushing people out of the country, what's pulling people in, what's, what's moving them to other places as well. So again, it's statistical modeling, but it's statistical modeling of both the impact of conflict on a situation that leads to enslavement, on to refugees. Right? Now, what are the big tells here, and what are the big key points to make about this? 
<coughs> and this is where we get to the relationship between slavery and environmental de uh, de destruction and CO2. You know, I, I told you about this potential that we now have for dramatically reducing CO2 from, say, brick kilns. But there's something even bigger than that. So if you were thinking about slavery as a country, and, and visualize it and, like that. You see, at 45 million people, it would be it would be a country with a population of Algeria, not the biggest country in the world, right? Or it's actually aren't there? Isn't 45 million a little bit more than the people in California? I think, but I'm, I don't remember. Okay, I got that from Wong Tai. He's from Los Angeles, so he should know. Um, we also have an estimation of the GDP. The global slavery that it's something the UN does every year. It's about 150 billion dollars. They say the GDP, as it were, of slavery on the globe is about 150 billion dollars. That's the GDP of Bulgaria or Kansas. Now, that especially that one blows my mind because I grew up near Kansas, and if, the, the idea that they've got 150 billion coming in the GDP is just I just don't get it. Where are they doing? What are they doing? I don't know. Because you go up there, and it's like. It was Kansas, right? Um, but here's the thing. If slavery were a country, it would be a poor, <coughs> small country. But what about if you take this country called slavery and you measure its CO2 emissions? Well, it turns out that this, the, the country called slavery has <coughs> carbon emissions that would make it the third largest carbon emissions country on the planet after China and the United States. No other country reaches 2.54 billion tons of CO2 emission. Now, when I was working on my book that became Blood and Earth, and I began to, to look at global deforestation, and I began to look at brick kilns, and I began to look at all these other types of things that we're generating CO2, especially deforestation, especially brick kilns and factories and all like that. I began to try to calculate how much CO2 in a conservative way, because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a scientist, I will never exaggerate. I, wanted, I was trying to work out the conservative estimation of how much CO2 could be attributed to slave work. And I got 2.54 or thereabouts billion tons per year. And I thought I had totally blown my work. I really did. I thought, this can't be possible. And I did it all again, I got the same answer. And then I said, okay, something I'm doing is terribly terrible. So I packaged up all my data, and I sent it to the 350 dollars right? The, the, the people who, who do the deep calculations of how much particulate and CO2 is in the air. And Bill McKibben was the head of it back then, and he and I had been on, a, on, this, on the same program together, so I knew Bill. And I said, hey, can you hand this to your scientists because I think I've totally blown it. And they came back with the same result. So I, I felt secure by right, putting this out here. Now, why am I excited about this number? Because if it's, if, as it seems to be true, it means that there's a soft spot in the emissions of CO2 that could be plugged by simply ending illegal activities. Right? This isn't about taking your cars away. It's not about you know doing anything, <coughs> stopping the coal miners, anything. It's about stopping criminal activity around the world, yes. But it's only about stopping criminal activity, which is already supposed to be stopped. Which means if we could get out there and as it were kick butt in terms of stopping slavery crime, we could actually, and if, and if you took away 2.54 billion tons per year, we would we'd either be we'd either reduce the speed at which CO2 is increasing or we'd stabilize it for a while. Anyway. It's right at that kind of break point where it would, it would slow almost to nothing or it would stop altogether. If we could do that. Now to me, that was one of the most exciting things I've ever learned in my life, because it actually opens a door. Of course now you have to get people to look through like you have to talk to politicians and say, Hey, if we stop slavery, we probably stop global warming, or at least slow it down. So, okay, that to me was a big one. Here's another big one. Some, there's been a couple of people in here who saw this in the class today, but we're also beginning to understand more about 
pro-slavery people and organizations around the world like um, ISIS. So you probably didn't know that ISIS has an online magazine, right, called The Beat. And it's very interesting, but, but I say this to everybody, I've said this in classes and I've talked to you today, don't go look at it online. Ser I mean, seriously, don't go look at it online because uh, Homeland Security will keep track of anyone who looks at the beak, right? So they might want to visit you if you want to get like on a list or something. So don't, don't look at it. Unless you're like, can have a good excuse or a really good or something like that. Now, ISIS is a very much a pro-slavery organization, right? And they also bring to bear something that Montai and I and others, uh, some other people we've been looking at in terms of how conflict and slavery are so deeply related with each other that we don't think about wars being about slavery, but in fact, when you look closely at wars, you find slavery, slavery, slavery. In this case, for example, this was the, the, this key article that says the re article, the revival of slavery before the hour. Now, that's a bit cryptic, before the hour. What it refers to is that under ISIS theological orientation to the planet, their, their form of, their interpretation of Islam says that there will be this Armageddon, this catastrophe, this cataclysmic end that will come in which ISIS will fight on the side of God. And it will bring basically the end of the world. And when they brought the end of the world, then they will have the new world, which will be like an ISIS world, a radically Islamic grouping. It will be that will be the planet Earth. Right? So it's like the next, the next version of the planet. And that's what the after the hour, before I mean before the hour, before the hour is the phrase that they used to talk about the hour when that cataclysm or that Armageddon begins. But they also talk about the revival of slavery because somehow within their theological, you know, corpus, they they say one of the key things that we're going to know that the, that the that the Armageddon is about to happen is because the amount of slavery is gone and it and it is increasing. Now, we saw this in particularly in northern Iraq in the in the Sinjar province when ISIS. Came. <coughs> okay, sorry about that. ISIS came and took over the land and the whole province of the Yazidi people. Right? Now, we've now got these internal records. Uh, we published them quite a bit out of these. We were able to get our hands on captured of ISIS records and then translate and work on the analysis of them. But they were making about $2 million a day from Syria. They basically rounded up the entire population of towns in the Yazidi era, areas. Some managed to, some Yazidis managed to escape onto the, the hills around Mount Sinjar and were ultimately picked up by some by American helicopters, but after a number of them had died of heat exposure. So, but <clears throat> they were using slavery as both a tactic, meaning they had a whole lot of uses for slaves, and they were also using it as a strategy. And why that, what I'm talking about, is their strategy was the extermination of the Yazidi people. Their religious theological leaders had been set, before they invaded, had been tasked with determining whether the Yazidi people could be allowed to live, because maybe they were linked to Jews or Christians or maybe Islam in some ways, or whether they were what they call mushrik, meaning devil worshippers, which means they should just literally be exterminated. And at the end of the day, they decided, nope, the mushrik, they should all be exterminated. Um, wait, we'll go back right there for a second. And the result was that the ISIS set up systems where every town that they would capture they would take the population, take all the men and the older boys off somewhere and kill them. They would take all the elderly women, meaning basically anyone they thought might not bear children, and they would take them to another location and kill them. And then they would begin divvying up younger women, women with children, 
women who hadn't had birth yet, girls, teens, and small boys. The small boys would be sent into military training and, and to be brainwashed and be renamed and so forth. But the, the women were then used for impregnation, to create more ISIS fighters, to reward ISIS fighters as gifts, as third wives, as and to be sold in online or in-person auctions. And that's where that, particularly that two million were coming from today, was they were selling young women all over the Middle East on online auctions with the idea that, that ultimately they just wanted to rid the entire area of any Yazidi. So between the people they would kill, the people they would crush and convert like the little boys, or the women they would send helter sculpture all over the place, or if they refused to have sex, they would kill them. It was a, it was a linked enslavement, genocidal, logistical, as well as tactical approach to conquest. So, that is like a case study of how genocide, slavery, conflict, turns out all fit together in ways that we don't think about when we just say, oh, ISIS has been kicking up and moving around. Now, one of the things that Monta and I have been doing in the last year or two is to take a database of conflicts, all the conflicts in the world that you can get from the Uppsala Peace Center in Sweden. But we took that and then began adding to it and researching every single conflict that was that had occurred between 1989 and 2016. 1989 because that was the end of the Cold War, and we're going to be pushing in both directions in time as we take this forward. Well, there were between between 1989 and 2016, there were they they count the number of conflicts in conflict years. So each con you know conflict may go on for five years, it may go on for one year, it may go on for ten. But between 1989 and 2016, with all the conflicts together, there were 1,113 conflict years in that, well, you know, basically 20, 30 year period or so, right? But 1,113 conflict years. And when we examined all of those and coded them and loaded, ask our, our researchers to search everything they could possibly find for that conflict in that year that would be any indicator of different types of enslavement, what we found was that there was even more slavery than we thought there could be. I mean, it, I, I think Monte and I both were, were I'll, I'll use the English as a gobsmack, when we realized that almost 90% of conflicts in that whole period had some form of enslavement within them. It, whether it was child soldiers, or sexual exploitation, or forced marriage, or human trafficking, meaning selling people on in order, order to make money out of them, forced labor, and domestic, domestic servitude, basically forced labor within a more domestic situations and like that. We, we knew there was something going out there. We, we, didn't, we didn't quite grasp until we got the numbers to spew out that it was quite this big. And we also discovered that as war intensifies, the, the conflicts often start between two sides, and, and they start in, in sort of a, what you might call them a normal military approach to each other. It's like my army and your army and your group and my group. And then as it intensifies, and, you, and, and they feel more risky, and they feel like they might be losing, they begin to use, they begin to operationalize and slave. They begin rounding, rounding up children, turning them into child soldiers. They begin rounding up young women and selling them to have more money to buy weapons and so forth. It's more likely to occur when a conflict occurs between a state government and one or more internal opposition groups and when there's no other intervention by neighboring state governments. So, it was a, it was a, it's yet another one of these strands that in our understanding of what happens in the world today with slavery, it's just, the more we look, and the more we look in specific ways between environmental destruction, what it does to people's mental health, what happens within conflict, its links to genocide and so forth, it's really 
take me us to a point where when I started working in this space, there were very simplistic ideas about victims and victims that needed to be rescued. And, these, and it was probably about sex trafficking. In other words, enslavement into commercial sexual exploitation. But they, it was always called sex trafficking. And it was emotive. And people were like running on fervor. And they had very, there were very disparate groups around the world that were often working in different directions from each other, but very often focusing on the same type of their imagined slavery, which was, again, very often only about the things that had to do with girls and women and potential sexual exploitation. And they were disorganized. They were, they were completely disorganized. Now we're beginning to get it. That it's not simplistic. It's complex. It's not emotive. It has to be dealt with logic. It's, it's not disparate. There's a unified approach that can be brought to these things, even when they cross all of these different kinds of boundaries. And you can get organized. You can actually get organized. And, and that's, in a sense, the foundation that we keep trying to build and build so that we can make more and more of an impact. Now, one of the things that we're on the verge of that I'm excited about is that we know about, you know, we know about trauma. And we know about brain trauma. We know about it for football players. U.S. veterans, right? People who've been in car accidents. Right? There's all, you know, you know, Albanian orphan children, right? Or Romanian orphan children. You know, we, we know about the brain imagery, but no one has ever done brain imagery of the specific types of trauma that, it, that you can read and understand better and treat better in the, in the, of the brains of people who are, have been in long-term enslavement. Now, we know that they come out of long-term enslavement with what's called complex PTSD as opposed to simple PTSD. And if you know the, the, the literature about PTSD, there's those two fundamentally different types of PTSD. Um, simple, P, the simple PTSD is like what happens if you get in a car and you have a very bad experience and it gives you the same sorts of sets of symptoms. But complex is for people who say have been kidnapped and tortured or held in slavery for years and years and like that. That's a very different kettle of fish when you have complex PTSD. Uh, Judith Herman is the key source on this. But now we're also able to look at the epigenetic impact. In other words, we know that PTSD, and particularly complex PTSD, alters the way the brain chemistry and the brain genetics express themselves in ways that it then are passed to children and to offspring and, and to do things to your, that do things to you physiologically as well. This is a, a key thing we want to get to because we have, there are millions of people in the world in slavery. We have millions of people in the whole history of the planet in slavery, and yet we've never dealt clearly and carefully and with deep understanding about their physiological and psychological things. One last little breakthrough and then I'm done. One of my colleagues, Austin Choi Fitzpatrick, uh, went to an area where I had worked in previously in northern India, where there were a whole series of villages where everyone in the village was fundamentally an enslaved, you know, an enslaved family, the entire village being enslaved. And there would be a local landowner who was a very feudal, very feudal situation. The local landowners would own the village and the people. And when you spoke to the people in the village, they would say, and you say, you know, how long have you lived here? And they would say, no, we've always been We've never been anywhere else. Who, you know, who's, who, do you have different jobs? Or they say, oh no, we all work for the, for the master. Right? Because the master, we belong to the master. The land, the houses, everything, we belong to the master. Somewhere, four, five, six generations previously, someone had taken a loan, had been taken control over, but in their isolation and brutality and sexual assault, the, 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 in the, that part of the Pradesh, the men who control these villages, always sexually assault the women in the villages. All of that creates a situation where they've never left. They have no clue. But also went there at a time when these groups of people were beginning to find liberation. In part because of work that Free the Slaves that I did, that I helped start, and with other programs that I still support. Actually, this is where I put my charity money, is into these villages 
where they can, over a three year process, can come from that kind of slavery to, to full freedom. But what he did was talk, he grew this huge beard that seemed to work for him with these guys. But he said, he went and talked to the masters in a gentle, quiet way, and he went and talked to people in slavery in a gentle, quiet way, or people coming out of slavery. And he began to get, for the first time, something we've never had before, which is this kind of conflicting and comparing of the in, internal workings of the minds of people who have been caught up in slavery and the masters, right, and the people who control them. They always must remain under us and we must remain above them, but all the lower castes are mischievous and now they're starting to act out. And he's saying, you know, my landlord threatened me and, and asked why I filed a case against him after he had learned how to do this from the NGO and how that he might have an opportunity to do so. And in those days, we were slaves. We were suppressed. We used to listen according to their terms. That's why we don't want this lie. And this, almost all of the people that were, were they were leaving, right, as they did this. One more. This one that I find really shocking. The, the, the person who was the master to that particular, this particular said, less and less boys are going to have sex, right, with lower caste women, right? I mean, it's, yeah, less of it. But, um, he says, we run into problems when the women don't accept. People don't really care about each other one anymore. And you get your head around. The idea that the kid, the male boys, took it as just their right to sexually assault people in the slave age. And it was normal, and it went on for generations. And now he's saying, now, we, now it's like they don't care anymore about us. They won't let us rip. It's just, it's kind of mind-boggling to me. And meanwhile, you know, you say the caste system that I am in is unfair, it's wrong, and I'll get beaten if I try to enter into another caste house, but we are human beings and they are also human beings. And it's a bad thing that these rules are put upon us. We've been collecting slave narratives, slave answers, slave discussions, slave stories, slave songs, slave poems, for quite a few years now, and we're just redoubling this. Because one of the things that's been tricky in the past is that you have these astounding and eloquent voices in the past, with, but they're very few. So you have Frederick Douglass, who has this amazing voice and this amazing insight. And you have Harriet Tubman, who has a voice and insight. And you have a few other people who are caught up in slavery, or were, and then they are, but, they're, but it's a tiny handful. And even they are often shaped very intensely by the writing norms of the time. So they kind of write in this Victorian style because that's the only way that most people who would buy their books would, would want to read. This is something completely different. This is where we begin to get a real insight into people's attitudes. Now, we were talking a lot about the Anthropocene today. Everybody kept that word? Yeah? Okay. Um, and following, you know, the trends, right? If, if you can look really small, you know, this is fisheries exploded, foreign investment levels, the oil depletion, ozone depletion, paper consumption, motor vehicles, species extinction, you know, these are all those indicators of, of over time of what's happening in the, uh, in the Anthropocene. And uh, it was interesting in class today and later Monta and I were both just talking through, like, how are we going to grasp the nature of enslavement as this situation of the anthropic reality increases, right? I, you know, in my worst moments, I think this situation is going to get so bad with all the things that can go wrong, when, when, the, when the fish are depleted, the forests are gone, on and on. That, that the idea of slavery will not be a, a, a concern. It will be going down to do we eat or do we die? Do, can we stay cool enough to stay alive? Right? Is there going to be water to drink? I mean, this is, that's what I, one of the things I worry about. And yet, I also know that if we were to work carefully, thoughtfully, and intensely to reduce the amount of slavery, we would also be reducing a whole series of these projected anthropocentric impacts on our lives and our futures. Now, 
Um, as an antidote to that, I'll tell you that the work that we do in India with villages who have been in slavery for generations begins and focuses when we <coughs> insert the Trojan horse of a primary school into the village. And it's when the children begin to learn to read and write, and the teacher begins to ch chat with the moms that come to help make the lunches, that the whole conversation begins. It lit takes a year or more to get them to understand that there's a reality out there which isn't about enslavement and is about contention. Well, one of the things that we've been documenting for 20 years now is, the, is the dividend that occurs when, when groups like this, where there are large amounts of slave people in slavery, there's a dividend that comes with freedom. That with education, with the ability to work for yourself, the ability to make your own plans, to make your own choices, the economics go up, the education goes up, the health care gets, the health gets better, right? Chronic diseases fall off, sexual assault falls off, all that, it goes on and on. There's a significant dividend that we've been documenting and showing that small investments in anti-slavery work actually lead to large outcomes in everything from food to education levels to women's choices and so forth. Okay, I'll stop there. I think that's enough. We've covered the entire planet. I didn't get to Antarctica, but I could do that now. There's not much happening in Antarctica. But I'd be really happy if you wanted to ask me some questions. Go ahead. You. No, okay. It was just overwhelming, wasn't it? Okay, yes. Yeah, I'm wondering so like the evidence of how slavery and uh, curriculum and uh, deportation is really interesting. Um, I was curious if slavery is removed from that equation, um, what that would definitely alter those activities, but how like what's the conclusion or what's the argument like with those end of the activities when slavery is replaced by other other labor sources, other things like that? No, not necessarily. Oh, like, yeah. and, the, and the reason why that's a good, that's a that's the right question. But in fact, one of the things about using enslaved labor is that virtually all large scale enslaved labor operations like the brick kiln are primitive. Right? I mean, really primitive. The, the way they make bricks using slave labor in India is exactly the kind of brick making that you read about in the Old Testament, right? When the, when the Jews need the straw to max, mix with the clay to put into a pot, right? They, that's the way they're making it. It's like biblical style of brick making. If you invested something like $1,200 oh, uh, equivalent, you could buy a Chinese brick shape. Right, where you just dump clay in one end and it breaks it and it runs on a little tiny bit of pepper. I mean, of gas. So there's all virtually all slave-based economic activities are only only operate because of slavery. And yet the enslavement means that the local economy can never cycle up. I mean, I saw one of the things that's, that I that I was very much aware of spending time with these folks were people who were enslaved, whole families enslaved, to make sand out of sandstone with hammers. Now wait a minute, sand, right? I mean, what is more ubiquitous and cheap than sand, right? But this 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 person could this slave owner could make a profit with like four or five families, including small children, with the big bunch with the sandstone boys going making sand with hammers. And I just thought the, the lunacy Right? Especially in a world where there are grinders and breakers and crushers and you know even some that you could operate with like you know, with, without without even an engine. So for the most part, if you can sweep that away, and that's what we're trying to do with the brick kilns, we're trying to sweep that away, and people then go on to other things. And also, when they come out of when they're not enslaved, they, the kids go to school. And the, and the parents learn, and they all decide, you know, there's other things we can do. We have freedom now. Let's go someplace. Yes? I wonder if you have any other ideas about solutions other than education. Um, and I wonder also if along those lines, if you can comment on efforts that occur like in Sudan, where you have NGOs that are trying to buy people out of slavery, 
and uh, critique that that's actually creating more slavery to meet the market. Well, yeah. people out. Firstly, on the first part of your question, there's lots of other ways, right? There's lots of, there's, there's reaching in there and helping people move away. There's going in and setting up uh, different types of businesses. And I mean, and, and, and sometimes it's just about getting law enforcement to, to do law enforcement, right? And that takes, sometimes you, it takes someone from outside who has a bit of power to say to law enforcement, do your jobs. And then they remove these physical and violent controls over people and then they, they blossom. Right? And, it, and it doesn't even, it's not a specific type of economic activity. I mean, one of the, one of the villages that I knew that were in quarrying slavery and had been for generations, when they had a chance to, to, to go to freedom, one of the chaps that we were very, we knew very well, because he'd been a bit of a leader. He's, he, he was like, we said, you know, you can get money from the Indian government to, to start something. And we'd say, what are you going to do? And he said, I, I, I can't talk about it. It's like, I, I, I'm just too nervous about it. Right? And then when I went back, like a year later, I found out he had taken his money. I thought he was going to like buy some tools, become a blacksmith. He became a traveling musical impresario that put on like comedy plays during the bridal season, right, with musical instruments and all these people acting out things and, and they get paid, right, to, at wedding balls. And I was like, how did he make this jump from being a slave in a quarry to being like Rogers and Hepperstein or whatever it was, right? So it, it was kind of wonderful. Once you give people freedom, you just don't know what you're going to get, right? Because all of us have that within us creativity and possibility like that. Now what you had to say about Sudan is kind of interesting to hear you say that because that hasn't been going on for decades. That's a, that happened a long time ago. That happened back in the 90s. And it was Christian Solidarity International and two or three other groups, uh, the American Anti-Slavery Group, who got very much involved in this buying people out of slavery in the Sudan. Do you think it's happening now? Yeah, well I just looked at their website because I wondered if it was oh, which going one? on Who? after Christian Solidarity. Are they back at it? I don't know. It seems to be. I mean, I'm, I'm astounded if they are because it was bogus then and it's bogus now. I mean, we, you know, I, I worked with some of the groups that at first they got in behind this. They're like, there was a big Canadian organization that said, oh, let's do this. You know, we can buy these people out of slavery. Um, when they finally went there to look closely and they took away and they were smart enough not to be just the bubble by it, they realized we're buying the same people over and over and they're not even slaves. They're just local members of the population. But that was when the war was still going on. You know, now since South Sudan is a different country, and it, it shouldn't be going on at all. I can't believe they're still doing it, because I thought it had been completely debunked. But it was wrong then, and if they're doing it, it's wrong now. That's not the way you get people out of slavery. You don't buy them out of slavery. That's like paying a burglar to get the television. Any other? Yes, ma'am. Um, I was Well, there, there are two parts to your question. Is, the, is this happening in this way along with supply chains? And is this a viable way to, to, to attack it? A lot of what you described is, is lousy, unfair, not good enough working conditions that, that need to be unionized and sorted out, right? Um, the slavery that occurs is usually not in that part of the supply chain. It's below it. It's a lot of the stuff that they may be actually packaging, right? Particularly if it's come from prisons in China, right? In the Uyghur region of China. Slaves to make these things, which is the soul things, or whoever. The other tricky thing, though, about worrying about slavery in your supply chain is the complexity of the supply chains and the levels at which there's a there's like a curtain of darkness that falls on the supply chain. Now, if you don't have to, but if you were to go get my book Blood and Earth, I I go through a very clear supply chain where I follow some minerals from from a war zone in Congo where I've seen the slaves digging the minerals, and I followed them all the way into Europe to an island. Um, I've slightly simplified it because there's like 
42 steps, and I've taken it down to like 19, right? Um, but there's a point along these supply chains where illegality, lying, and subterfuge occur. And it's that point that you have to somehow get over that, that fence to look behind. Because once it's, you're over the fence, then, for example, Rwanda is one of the largest exporters of the mineral cassiterite, which you must have in your bones, in the world. But there is no cassiterite in Rwanda. It's all being taken across the border by people who are carrying big buckets of it on their back from the Congo, who have been mining it in slavery. But, but it's hard for the, it's hard to get that. It, in some ways, the best way to deal with that with the supply chains is to is to work with those organizations that go to the root, that actually go to the mine. Right? We recently, I wish I had pictures of it. We recently worked new ground penetrating lidar satellite and drone work in Tanzania and identified a whole series of underground mines that were filled with slave workers under the city, right? Where they they dug all these tunnels and were mining under the city, but nobody could tell and see it until we used lidar to do the penetration to see it. Like that. The world is still tricky in terms of consumption. There's a lot of companies who have tried to do their best and are thinking they're trying to do their best, and so there's some that don't care, they don't give a hoot. And you kind of, I mean, I use Good For You one app on my phone, which I can put anything in there and it'll tell me well, what they know about the supply chain and if they're honest. So it's complex and it's hard, and I've spent a lot of time with these questions. And I get a bit frustrated with it. But if in doubt, don't buy them. Any last question? Do I see we're getting toward people? Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm wondering where the definition of human trafficking is going to change. Like, uh, also I read the book, like, the book said you wrote that an uh, organization with the achievable moral goals face self extinction. So, and also, like, in the past, we say human trafficking is slavery, and now we include more. Like criminal activity, would that be in the future? That's a slightly tricky question, and, and it has to do. And, I, and I'm sorry that I got I got to zoom around a little bit. One of the things about human trafficking as a thing and slavery as a thing is that in most parts of the world, they're basically the same thing, and it's called slavery, right? For some reason, in the United States, the term human trafficking became the term. And part of it had to do with like the, the, a bill that I worked on uh, back in the year 2000, the, 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 the Traffic, Trafficking Prevention Act, right? Um, so trafficking became the word in this country. Most of the countries in the world, they don't use the word trafficking, except when they're describing <clears throat> the literal transportation of someone to be sold into slavery. That's what, that's what trafficking is in most definitions. The other thing that, and I'm not sure which book you're referring to necessarily, but, oh yeah, see that's an older book. Now, we've moved on. And one of the things that, that happened since that book came out was a large number of experts and scholars and legal scholars and judges <coughs> and others met in different places around the world for two years to say we must have a viable definition that everyone can use. And at the end of the day, there was, there was something published called the Bellagio Harvard Guidelines on the definition of sin. And you can pull it down off the web, and it's in all languages. In the language. But it very simply says, it goes back to the 1926 League of Nations definition of sin. And it basically says, slavery is when a person is treated as if they are property. Not that they are legal property, but treated as if they are property. What can you do with your property? You can sell it. You can use it. You can rent it out. You can use it as collateral. You can destroy it. Get it your problem, right? That's the old Roman law, in some ways, about what you can do with your property. But used in the 1926 thing, <clears throat> the crucial thing, and this is terribly nerdy, forgive me, there's only two more sentences, is that it gave us for the first time an, a definition it could be used as both a complete and perfect legal definition because it meets all the international standards, 
and what's called in social scientific work an operational definition. So you can go to a place, watch people doing what they do, talk to them about their lives, and you can tick the boxes, right? And say, and they can tell you whether or not they are treated as if they are property, or you can see it, right? And then on the legal side, that's a whole other thing, but it's still sound. Lawyers and judges like it, we like it on the science side. And so that was that was an attempt of mine several quite a few years before to come up with something. Guys, I think I'm done. Thank you ever so much.